I am invincible. I am one. God, it's a beautiful thing to be a woman. Thank you. Labor's Chorus. And I want to thank Elise. That was so inspiring. And she knows that song gets to me every time because it's an anthem. And it's being reinvented uh, for this generation, which is phenomenal. And I just want to thank Elise. Okay, she said I'm creative. Now the bar has been raised. Uh, I'll be um, drawing, making drawings later if anyone wants, wants one. Um, but thank you for the kind words um, and that introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Uh, and uh, for your countless contributions and your leadership uh, of Clue. I mean, she is bold. She's not afraid, and I love that snap. Sister's not afraid of power. That's Elise Bryant. So thank you, Elise. And the work you do with Labor Heritage Foundation, the Labor Chorus, and the Labor Choir, and everything that you do, you wear so many hats. Uh, I don't know how you do it. Um, Want to say my deepest thanks, obviously, to all of the national officers. I saw Carla right there on the aisle, uh, Judy Beard, I know Joanne Sanders, Benny Bridges, Carol Rosenblatt, uh, thank you for your leadership, as well as all the vice presidents, all 17 of you, and all the Clue state presidents and vice presidents. And thank you for all the work you do on the ground because that is where it matters. And I'm told there are now 37 Clue chapters and counting incredible proof of your success. And so congratulations, I think this is the 20th year of this conference and I think 45 years um, fighting for women in the labor movement. And I think back to the beginnings of Clue and what it must have been like. When women were shut out, didn't have a voice, didn't have a seat at the table in our unions, and how critical it was to have this space to talk about our issues, to grow our leadership. And I just, I can't imagine the struggle, really, that those women went through. And I am incredibly grateful for the work of the sisters before me. So let's just give a hand to our sisters and that 45 years of struggle we stand on your shoulders. And I just want to say, I just saw a sister that I, I stood on her shoulders in terms of leadership of the AFL-CIO. I know Linda Chavez Thompson's here in the room. Just want to say thank you to Linda. Yeah. And I heard you were out uh, lending voice in the streets for Stations Casino yesterday. Right? Online. Online? Electronic activism, I love it. So that fight has been going on forever and to have your voices raising that struggle uh, is exactly what we need in this moment. And in fact, I'm actually gonna be leaving here and going to Chicago to walk the picket line with teachers. That's right. These struggles, these fights, that's what we're about. I don't want to lose sight of we're here in this room and we're planning and we're strategizing, but we're also virtually and physically out on those uh, picket lines. And I'm so proud to be here with you today. I love bragging that the labor movement is the largest movement of working women in the country. And if you're on Twitter, go ahead and tweet that out. Seven million women in the labor movement. That's bigger than now. That's bigger than Planned Parenthood. That's bigger than any organization of women in this country. And we're growing and we have each other's backs, don't we? And I recently traveled to Minnesota for the Trades Women Build Nations Conference. Was anyone there? Yeah, Jessica, <laughs> one person. Um, okay then. So many of you may not be familiar with this conference. So it brings together, I think we had over 2,500 or 2,800, 2,700, there she is, 2,700 tradeswomen across 14 crafts um, in construction to hone their leadership skills and build their networks. And I had the opportunity to speak there. And the energy in that room, I'm telling you, was it not amazing? Okay, I'm looking at you. Um, 
I could have said, the grass is green. And everyone was like, wow, you know, because they were just so excited. And I said, if you could bottle that, just 30% of it, and sprinkle it across our labor movement, it would revolutionize the labor movement. Uh -huh. And so I started out by asking the audience how many of them had worked on a job site where they were the only woman. Guess how many hands went up, okay? Oh, yeah. So I was just going to ask you that same question, but apparently you anticipated, right? <laughs> I know folks in this room have had that same experience, but you can only imagine when construction where women are 3%, um, every hand went up. And how many of you, and I asked them this as well, have been called aggressive or pushy for simply asking a question or, or pointing out basic information? Oh, yeah. How many of us have been asked to take notes instead of offer ideas? Oh, yeah. Got my hand up. So my point is, the reality is that too few women are in leadership roles. And research has proven it over and over again. And this reality actually plays into what is called, it's a theory called the broken rung. And if you picture a ladder in that first rung of the ladder and how broken that is because some women can't even get to that first step, get past that first step to make it into leadership before they even think about shattering the, quote, glass ceiling, right? You got to get past the first rung on that leadership ladder, whether it's in your union or in the workplace. And that is a tougher task than you might think. And here's why. I just read a study, for every 100 men that are promoted, only 72 women get that same chance. It's almost like our pay ratio, right? Like the, the 70, 80% to, to 100. And so this means that more women are stuck in entry level positions and unable to advance in their careers. And I know that sometimes this news can be overwhelming. And you're like, I really wanna start my morning with that you know, Debbie Downer, right? Um, but it's easy to feel defeated sometimes. But that is not what we do in this room. That's right, says the brother in the front row. <laughs> what we do as women, as sisters, is we fix it. And we get to work. And we find solutions and get things done together. And all of us supporting each other is how we do that. And that's what being in a union is all about. The unbreakable bond of sisterhood and solidarity. And what an opportunity we have to lift each other up and help repair that broken rung of the leadership ladder right now. This is a moment in this country, in our movement, where working people, especially women, are taking risks. And they're rising up collectively more than ever before. Are you feeling this? Are you seeing this? Every movement I see out there, it, women are on the front lines, right? Women like Fatumata Ba, local 26 member. She's a housekeeper at the Battery Wharf Hotel in Boston. She had a terrifying incident on the job last year when a male guest became so enraged with her that she thought he was going to attack her. She ran out of the room. She called security. No one came. She is, and Local 26 is, right now on strike up in Boston. And one of their demands is that housekeepers be provided with panic buttons to alert the security and keep workers safe. And it's a protection that thousands of Unite Here members won last year in other cities, along with better pay and the right to bargain over technology. Those were kind of the three big demands about you know, with the Marriott strike last year. And now we have to send, whether it's virtual or not, strong solidarity messages to Local 26 because they have to win that fight, and they will with the entire labor movement at their back. That's right. 
And look at what else is happening across the country right now. We just saw 50, almost 50,000 UAW members on strike against GM. That's right. And they refuse to settle for anything less than the wages and the respect that they deserve. And you heard yesterday they have a tentative agreement and they're working their way through that process. I was out on that picket line and I know there's a stereotype, right, of auto workers. Sometimes people get this image of, of men who are, you know, like the big burly dudes on the picket line. I walked with single moms on that picket line. I worked with, I walked with women who were tier two workers who said, you know what, I've been working for seven years alongside a, a UAW member who's earning more than I am doing the same job. And that has to be fixed and that's why I'm out here, right? What about teachers? Not only in Chicago, but over the last couple of years, even in the South, right? Grocery workers in New England, right? I walked with those stop and shop workers and they put it all on the line. They risked everything. Hospitals, auto plants, universities, workers are speaking out and taking risks. And again, women are leading the way. And not only in the labor movement, but in movements around us. With two words, me too. Yes. We have fundamentally changed the conversation, haven't we? about sexual assault and harassment in the workplace. And union women raised their voices in that movement as well. And we have been fighting sexual harassment in, for decades, right? We've been using our collective bargaining agreements and our contracts to fight against it. But women who aren't in unions, they don't know this. They don't connect the labor movement to this fight. They don't know that we are a voice for all working women and that fighting sexual harassment is fundamental for the labor movement. And that goes for the workplace, but also within the labor movement itself, right? We will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, bullying, assault, violence in our labor movement as well. And we know when we stand together what true worker power can do and that collective action and collective bargaining can literally change the world. And every day, in every way, women are building this movement and leading the path forward. But we have to be honest. There are movements happening around us, often without us. And we in the labor movement need to be modern and nimble and responsive to be relevant to the women in today's economy. And I'll give you one example. US Women's National Team won the World Cup. What were they chanting in the stadium? Equal pay, equal pay. Is that a fight that the labor movement has been involved in? Hell yeah. But for some reason, we weren't connected, were we? to what the soccer team was doing and saying and what we were doing and saying. And at our last executive council meeting, I reached out to the Players Association. They're a union representing these women. I said, we need to connect our union movement in these fights. We're fighting alongside each other on the same issue. So we, said we um, actually passed a solidarity resolution at the executive council, and now we're starting to figure out how we coordinate their fight and our fight, and we're actually getting Chicago Red Wings players, we're in the process hopefully of getting them out on the picket line to connect those fights. So we have an incredible moment, as I said, in front of us, and the question is, are we going to take a hold and grab it? Will we use this moment of historic collective action to grow our unions? Yes. Are we gonna try some new things? Are we gonna experiment yes. and take some risks and not be afraid to fail, right? Because right. sometimes we're afraid to fail, we don't try new things. And we're never gonna get those breakthrough strategies if we don't try new things. So we should be thinking about what are the new ways that we can make unions relevant and indispensable 
to people's lives? How do we become closely connected to people's every day? Now, you say, well, of course, with our contracts, yes, and our innovations that we negotiate. We need to be lifting those up. We need to be talking about them. And we need more women at the bargaining table to make them happen. That's right. Now, I mentioned the Trades Women Build Nations Conference last week, and there was a lot of talk about the challenges of recruiting and, more importantly, retaining women in construction. I told you about that 3% number, right? Well, the iron workers said to themselves, hmm, is there something we can do to retain more women in our union? What about trying something like paid maternity leave? Would that help us? Well, let's give it a try. So they did. And they actually now have a paid maternity leave policy that rivals some of the most progressive organizations in the country. Who knew? We got to talk about it. Six months, paid leave. So you think that risk might pay off in terms of more women staying in the union? Yeah. And feeling more connected to the labor movement? I think so. What about other contract innovations like AFSCMEs, flexible scheduling options? Scheduling is a huge issue, right? And nurses who are advocating for breastfeeding moms to get breaks at work to pump. These are the ways we can use our contracts to help show women that this is a labor movement for them. Another way that we make ourselves relevant and closely connected is through cutting edge training and education that helps working people ladder up to better jobs. Like the tradeswomen that I met in Minnesota who said their apprenticeship program changed their lives. I know the AFT has been doing a lot with its innovation fund, which is bringing the nation's top educators together to change and improve how pre-K is taught. The union is doing this. And what about providing families the support that they need outside their workplaces in order to do their jobs? Do you think that would make people feel more connected to the labor movement if, say, for example, childcare was an issue that the labor movement innovated around. High quality, affordable child care. Is that an issue for most working people? Okay, well, UFCW, Local 1776 in Philadelphia, they have a paid child care benefit for their members, right? I can imagine that that makes the union an indispensable part of people's lives, right? And finally, if people see unions taking action to help improve our communities, they will definitely feel more connected to us, even if they're not a member, right? So what about like responding to natural disasters? Does the union movement respond in a hurricane, in a fire, in an earthquake? Absolutely, we're on the front lines, often as first responders, but in our communities. And when a community is most in need after a disaster and the labor movement responds, people will never forget that. And it makes them see that we are fighting for them. We're fighting for affordable housing. We're fighting for legislation and policies that make lives better for working people. And then right to work becomes irrelevant because people will want to join us because they see the labor movement as them not this other, right? I don't know if you've seen the recent Gallup poll. 65% of the public approves of unions. 65%. That is a 50-year high. I'm telling you, this is the moment for us to surge, for us to take a hold and grab this momentum. So what do we do now? What is next? Well, we work on fixing that broken rung in that ladder and encourage more women to become leaders. And I'm just going to say it, you don't always have to be at the, the front of the room. You don't always have to be the one giving the speech. You could start by, if you've never even spoken at your union meeting, 
Maybe raise an issue that's important to you. Maybe lift up the work of, of another sister who's slogging it out behind the scenes and no one's noticing. Anybody been there? <laughs> lift that work up so that people see it. Run for an executive board position in your union. And here's the important part. Reach back and pull another woman up that ladder behind you. This is the most impactful thing we can do. Support other women, right? And that succession planning. So the next piece of fixing the broken leadership rung is encouraging more women to run for office. And I know you're talking about this, but we're going to talk about it again. Do not say, who, me? Me run? Yes, you. Why not you? Research shows, and I've talked about this before, I know at this meeting, that it takes on average seven times for a woman to be asked before she'll run for office. Seven times. Oh, I don't have enough experience, even though you've been working in the field for 20 years, right? Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Trust me. We all do it. And you are smart enough and good enough. And I did it too when I ran for this job, right? No offense to the guys in the room, but on average it takes one time for a man to be asked, usually. And sometimes they run even when no one is asking. Well. No, uh, no offense, but you know, it is, it's, there's something there. And look at the guy in the White House, okay? He never ran for anything before. And then he runs for president. All right. So one silver lining of Donald Trump's election has been that all these women are now running for public office. Have you seen this? <laughs> Thousands of women at all levels of government. And our sisters are doing us proud on that debate stage, right, for president. And how about Nancy Pelosi? Okay. Did anyone... <laughs> Did anyone see that picture this morning trending? Oh, wow. Oh, my God. If anyone has not seen this image that's been floating around of Nancy Pelosi, who was in this White House briefing of all men standing up, taking on the president, and then he tweets out that she's unhinged, which I love that she then changed it to her profile pic. I was like, this is perfect. So now we need more union women to run for office because when union voices are in the halls of power, we can create all that change that we need. And we have so many examples of sisters that are stepping up. Julie Kushner, I know, state senator in Connecticut, former UAW Region 9A director. Uh, we've got, you know, I was just in Connecticut uh, with her and it was so proud, it was a proud moment to think about her fighting for the $15 an hour minimum wage and passing that in that state. And then right here in Nevada, thanks to the work of state senators like Yavana Cancela, also a member of culinary workers here in Nevada, she, she led the charge for 20,000 public sector workers to win the right to collectively bargain in, in the state of Nevada. Talk about change. And Nevada made history this year as the first state with the first with a female majority legislature, which is a huge milestone. So if this kind of progress can be made here in Nevada, it can happen everywhere in the country. And I think particularly women union members running in greater numbers is gonna make that happen. So the, <laughs> the bottom line here is that we need voices like yours. Believe in yourself, hone your skills, build your network and ask what you can do to mentor another sister. And our sisterhood is powerful. And if we use it, we support it, we grow it, we will win. Let's fix the, the broken rung of that ladder. Let's protect the promises made to generations before us and seize the opportunities of tomorrow. Sisters, we are the women of the labor movement. We are strong, we are powerful, we are united, and nothing can stop us. Thank you.